Thank you very much to the music group and welcome back to our uh, afternoon session. In this talk, I'm going to be addressing the central theme of the conference, which is trusting in God. And when I was doing my preparation, I was reminded of a program that Deacon Don and myself were doing on Radio Maria. We discussed the catechism on Saturday nights uh, at eight o'clock. And we were dealing with the catechism's teaching on original sin. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you think the original sin actually was? I wouldn't be surprised if the vast majority would say, it was disobedience, Father. Adam and Eve were disobedient to God. Now, of course, there's great truth in that. They were disobedient. But what's interesting about the catechism is that it says that the original sin was mistrust of God. I'm going to read what it says. This is in paragraph 397. Man, of course, it always says in man, man and woman, tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart. It's worth repeating. Man tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator to die in his heart. So Adam and Eve trusted completely in God when they were in the garden. But the devil tempted them, and his first temptation is, why do you trust in God? Is God really trustworthy? And he, he, he says to Adam and Eve, uh, you know, did God really tell you not to eat the fruit of any tree in the garden? Do you notice he's questioning, is God reliable here? Did, did, did he really say that? That was raising a question mark. And then Eve answers, yes, he told us that if we ate of the fruit of the tree, that we would die. And then the devil says, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. Isn't it ironic? The devil, who's the father of lies, Jesus was to say, the truth is not in him. Here the devil is questioning whether God is reliable. He's suggesting God is a liar. God has hidden motives in telling you this. So you shouldn't depend on God. Don't believe a word he says. Now that seems to have softened up Adam and Eve, where their unconditional trust is now weakening. And it's in that context then that they do their own thing. They do what is good in their own eyes and they eat of the forbidden tree. And that cuts the umbilical cord that connected them with God in such a beautiful and intimate way. And they're cast out of the Garden of Eden and all their sufferings and indeed ours follow from that. So I'm suggesting to you that the original sin was mistrust of God. In spite of the fact that the devil says, we may be unfaithful, but God is always faithful. So it would seem to me that if we're to recover from original sin, and surely that was the purpose of Christ coming on earth to restored the kingdom of God the way God had intended it to be, that the basic foundation stone must be that we grow in trust in the God of the promises and trust in the promises of God. That our spiritual life is growing in faith, growing in trust. And this raises the issue, how do we grow in trust in God? And the, the secondary question is, and how do we grow in trust in the promises of God, which are mighty? 
Now, I used to teach the psychology of religion many years ago, and one of the things I can remember from those days was that we would be teaching what's known as developmental psychology. How does a person develop over a lifetime? The first developmental task that any child faces after it's born is will it trust in its carers or will it mistrust them? Now, one of the things that psychology would say is that a baby doesn't choose to trust in its carers, usually the mother and father. That trust is evoked by the child's experience of the parent's love. If the parents, and particularly the mother, is attuned to the baby and the baby's needs and responds to them in a, a predictable and dependable way, that dependability which expresses love will evoke trust in the child. But the extent to which the caring is defective for one reason or another is the extent to which the child's ability to trust its parents or carers um, will be wounded and will be compromised. And I think the vast majority, majority of us limp out of our childhood with a, a kind of a, a limited ability to trust in other people. And because our images of God are dependent on our images of childhood caring, many of us have a very compromised ability to trust in God either. And this is a big problem. And if we're to overcome this problem, it means that we need to have a positive experience of God, as God really is. And the more we have a positive experience of God, the more that experience will evoke trust in our hearts. Remember, faith and trust is a gift. It's not something that's within our own power. So I want to insist that faith is evoked, trust is evoked by our, our experience of the living God. It's not something that we decide to do. Now, I want to say that in Ireland, I've noticed over the last, I'm in the charismatic renewal for 50 years. I started off in 1974. And I've noticed that I'm sad to say that the majority of Irish people, and I was one of them before I had my conversion experience, while they know a good deal about the person of Jesus, they don't know Jesus in person. They've got ideas in their head, some anyway, about what, who Jesus was and what he was like. But you wouldn't say that they have a personal relationship with him. Now, I had a conversion experience when I was 29. I was three years ordained at this stage. But I did, I moved for, away from just knowing about the person of Jesus. And when the love of God was poured into my heart, I was given the greatest grace of my life a strong, personal, intimate relationship with Jesus as he really is. Now, what brings that about, we're beginning to see, is what we call baptism in the Holy Spirit. The word baptism means to drench, to soak, to inundate, to fill. It's like putting a sponge into a basin. You squeeze out all the dirty water, and then as the sponge opens up, it absorbs in the clean water that's in the bowl. We all receive the Holy Spirit in baptism, but often we didn't tap into its power. It was buried within our experience. So baptism in the Spirit is a moment where the power of the Holy Spirit is released within us. It's like water bubbling up in a well. And if you were to ask me, what is 
baptism in the Spirit about. I think it's well described in Ephesians chapter 3, where St. Paul prays this beautiful prayer. This was prayed for me the moment before I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. May you have power together with all God's holy people to know the length and the breadth, the height and the depth of the love of Jesus, which surpasses your understanding, that you may be filled inwardly with the very fullness of God. I remember when those words were read to me before I was prayed with, they jumped off the page with absolute relevance. And I remember just yearning within me, oh, I want to go beyond the God of the philosophers, the God of ideas. I want to experience the living God, the God who loves me. And when I was prayed with, the power came upon me and all of a sudden, everything was light. It was a mystical experience. And I knew to the foundations of my being that I was loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what everyone needs. And of course, when, you, when, when his power breaks through all your false images and negativity, you, you, you have this kind of exhilarating, joy-filled sense, my goodness, I'm loved as I am, warts and all. And then you, you feel, I, I can trust this God. This is the God who loves me, who wants what's best for me. So that we, 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 we've moved, of course, a big journey from knowing about the person of Jesus to knowing him in person. And is it any surprise that Pope Francis has said, and I'm quoting his words directly, I want everyone in the church to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. 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 And he gives the reason. He says straight afterwards, so they may have a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ as he really is. And, and, and it's when we're in that relationship with Jesus that our trust levels shoot up. It's a reversal of original sin. And it says in Romans ch chapter 10, verse 17, and by the way, I want to draw to your attention, this is the only verse in the Bible that tells us how trust increases. Paul says, trust comes from hearing the message about Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing God's word, the word of love, the word of promise that the Holy Spirit will be given to us and that that Spirit will lead us into the truth about God. And the more it does, the more we trust in God. Now, if we trust in the God of the promises, there's a good chance that we're going to begin to trust in the promises of God. And there are many, many promises in the Bible. And I was asking the Lord, which ones should I highlight for this talk this afternoon? And two came to mind. The first one is from Psalm 37, verse 5. Oh, I love this verse. Treasure this verse, brothers and sisters, when you go home. The Lord says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will act. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and he will act. And the other one that I love, it's in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 33, or is it 36? Uh, it, it, the Lord says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all else will be added to you. Everything will be added to you. 
Now, do you notice in those two promises that God is saying, I will do this, but there's an if clause, if you do that. So I will act, he says in Psalm 37 verse 5, yes, I will act on your behalf in powerful and wonderful ways, but the condition is trust in the Lord with all your heart, not with part of your heart, with all of your heart. And he says that everything that we need will be added to us if, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that we're seeking God's will, we're seeking God's purposes. And if we're utterly committed to that, then you don't have to worry about the everyday realities. They'll tend to look after themselves. Now, I've found in the course of my life that that is so true. Um, and I thought that for the sake of um, clarity that I would give some examples. Um, but before I do, I just want to say that if you have real trust in Jesus, and if you have trust in his promises, you will be equipped to deal with the troubles in your life. Now, I think that we're going to face into very difficult times, and I don't say this lightly. I have studied what the popes of the 20th century were saying about the future. And there's a consistent theme going through from the beginning of the 20th century from Pope St. Pius X right up to John Paul II and indeed uh, Benedict XVI, that great troubles were going to come upon the church and upon the world. Now, we haven't the time to go into all of this, but I just want to give one example, and it's a prophecy that was given by St. John Paul II. So we're not dealing with some person who's unreliable here. We're dealing with a saint and a man who is the Pope. But he was a very gifted man, as you all know. And one of the gifts he had was a gift of prophecy, a gift of reading the signs of the times. And on one occasion he said, it lies within the plans of divine providence that is, the chastisement that is coming. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church will take up and face courageously. We must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials before long, such as will demand of us a disposition to give up even our life and a total dedication to Christ and for Christ. With my prayers and yours, it is possible to mitigate this tribulation. Mitigate means to lessen this tribulation. But it is no longer possible to avert it because only thus can the church be effectively renewed. So, if you go by that prophecy, and by the way, I could quote many others from popes that would back that up, uh, we're heading into very difficult days. Now, I don't want to dishearten you. I'm just saying I think this is the reality of the situation. How those difficulties will come to us, God only knows. It could be war. Pope Francis has said we're already at the beginning of World War III, and we don't know where it's all going to end. Will the war in the Ukraine spread into Western Europe? By the way, there are many prophecies which go back a long time which say that Russia is going to invade Western Europe. And it also, they say, that they will head for Italy and take over the Vatican. And many deaths of priests will take place and the Pope will be persecuted. But that this invasion of Italy will not last for too long. I don't know if that's reliable but it has been said by a number of different prophets. So we could have war, 
we could have another worldwide pandemic, which would be more serious than COVID. We could have an economic collapse <coughs> because a lot of countries are now floating on a sea of debt. So I think we will have troubles in the future and they will really be very difficult to bear with. But if you trust in the Lord Jesus, and you trust in his promises, you will have a guarantee that you will be helped to journey through the valley of darkness without fearing the evils that will be abroad in the world. And to notice John Paul said, these tribulations which are coming down the line, um, some people will even be asked to give their life to be faithful to Christ during these times of tribulation that they are necessary for the purification of the church. Isn't that interesting? Now, I think it'll also humble people in the world and that they will be so battered and bruised as a result of the tribulation that they will cry out for God. And I think that will give us an opportunity for great evangelization as the tribulations are beginning to come to their end. And of course, we all have tribulations in our personal lives, all kinds of turmoil in our families to do with health, mental health, physical health, finances, and so on. Addictions uh, very widespread in Irish society at the moment. And if you have deep trust in the Lord Jesus, if you have trust in his promises, you will be able to cope with these things that come down the tracks. The Lord doesn't guarantee that we're going to have an easy life, but he guarantees that we'll be able to negotiate it and that he will be with us and he will be blessing us. So the Lord is counseling us, grow in trust. You can trust in me, the Lord God. Now, I thought I would like to give a personal example of trying to live by trust. I could give loads of them, by the way, but one came to my mind and I thought, that's the one I'll share. A few years ago, well, actually, it's many years ago now, I was invited to go to Canberra in Australia for three days <laughs> to, to preach over a weekend. I mean, it was daft, the whole idea of flying to Australia just for three days work. But anyway, it tickled my vanity to be asked to go to Canberra. So I accepted the invitation. God forgive me. But anyway, off I headed on the plane. And on the way, I noticed that I was getting a sore throat. Have you noticed, those of you who've traveled a lot, that often on planes you get an infection. I think it's because of circulating the air in the aircraft. But anyway, I was getting a sore throat. And that worried me. And by the time I reached Canberra, I was speaking in a rather husky voice, but I was well able to speak. And I, I did speak on the Friday night of the conference and again on the Saturday morning. But by late Saturday morning, I had developed laryngitis and my voice just disappeared completely. And all I could do was whisper to people. And I was, I was so mortified because I thought these poor Australians have paid for me to come out here to Canberra and the Egypt from Ireland can't even speak. <laughs> you know, what have we done? So as I say, I was mortified and I was staying with some priests um, who were leading a very strict and austere life, I may say. And um, I, I remember during the night of the Saturday night, I couldn't sleep at all and I was praying and imploring God and saying, oh God, you know, I'm in a terrible dilemma here. You must help me. And as I was praying, a number of scripture texts came to me and I thought I better um, keep these in mind. And one was the one I've already quoted, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your understanding. Well, no, that's Proverbs chapter three, verse five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't rely on your understanding. Now, I couldn't see how I could get my voice back. 
you know, but I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to lean on my understanding. Nothing is impossible to God. And Psalm 37, verse 5, which I've already quoted, commit your, your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. So I'm saying to the Lord, look, I'm handing over my life and my voice to you. Uh, I trust in you, and I'm believing that you are going to act. I don't know how, but I am believing in you. And of course, I also had to bribe the Lord and say, listen here, Lord, I'm seeking first your kingdom by coming here to preach all the way across the world to Canberra. And you did say, and all else will be added to you. Come on, that's your promise. Divvy up and give me what I need. Give me back my voice. I remember going into the shower in the morning and I thought I'll try and sing a hymn. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> nothing whatsoever came from my throat. I thought I'm banjaxed, you know, no voice. And I went into breakfast and they were saying, how's your voice? And all I could whisper back was, it's still gone. I've no voice. So a priest came over to me and he said, well, Pat, I can see you've no voice and you won't be able to give the talk on Pentecost Sunday morning. The whole purpose of my going there and he said, what I'll do is I'll step in in your place. So I thought, oh, thanks be to God. And you know, yeah, thanks, Father, you do that. But when the breakfast was over and I went back to my room, I was thinking of the prayers I had said during the night, you know, trusting in the Lord and that he would give me all that I need. And I thought, no, no, I, I was almost betraying him by saying to the priest, you do the talk instead of me. So I went back to him and in a whisper, I said, listen, Father, can we do things like this? When it comes for the time for me to talk, call me forward and I'll go to the microphone and if I can't talk, you come forward and give the talk. So he said, okay, that's fine. So I went down to the conference hall and they were singing hymns and all that and I was trying to get my voice started, you know, and I was trying to speak, nothing whatsoever, just whispers. And then the priest said, and now I'm calling Father Pat forward to, to the microphone to give his talk. Poor Father Pat hadn't said a word in 24 hours. And I went forward. Listen, I, I get moved even when I think of it now. I went forward to the microphone. And I, I was thinking in my mind, thou, O Lord, will open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. I opened my mouth and wonder of wonders, there was my voice. Yes, it was hoarse and husky. It didn't have great volume, but when they turned up the, the audio in the, in the hall, they could all hear me perfectly clearly. I gave a talk for three quarters of an hour. My voice held up. Then they said, will you say mass and give a homily? I said the mass and gave the homily. This was all a surprise. They said, will you lead a healing service? And I thought, okay, I'll lead a healing service. And I did the healing service. And the second the healing service ended, guess what? No voice. And I didn't have any speech for about three days later. Actually, I went back to Ireland with no voice because the laryngitis was so bad. But it was amazing that when I needed to speak, how close I felt God the Father was to me that morning. That there I was on Pentecost Sunday, relying on the promises of God because I relied on the God of the promises. And God was faithful. God is always faithful. And I'm just encouraging you, trust in Jesus and trust in what he's promised. You know, at the bottom of the divine mercy picture is that wonderful prayer. I don't think it can be bettered. Often when I'm in confessions, as a penance, I just say to the person, for goodness sakes, say three times after confession, Jesus, I 
trust in you. Now, it's easy to trust him when everything is going hunky-dory. It's very hard to trust in him when nothing is going right. So the test of trust is trial. But if you trust him in your trials, blessing is released, and you will see that blessing even to the point of healings and miracles. It's when we trust in Jesus that we trust in his mighty promise, have faith in God. I solemnly assure you, if you say to this mountain, whatever it is, the big difficulty, be moved and have no hesitation in your heart because you've got complete trust, it shall be moved. And I think many of us are a bit too pathetic in our prayers. We're like Jesus when he was, or not like Jesus, we're like Peter. Do you remember when he walked on water, he was showing great trust for a few minutes, and then he got distracted by wind, waves, and gravity, and he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink. And then he's crying out in desperation, Lord, save me or I'll drown here. Now, Jesus does yank him out of the water, but he doesn't give him a pat on the back, and he says, oh, Peter, you have little faith. You see, you've got that weak, milky, watery faith. That's not what impresses me at all. And far too many Catholics have that weak faith. And why are they weak in that faith? Because they don't know who they trust in. It's the Lord Jesus. You have to deepen that relationship. As I say, by experiencing one outpouring of the Holy Spirit after another, by praying and meditating on the scriptures which increase your faith and focusing on the promises which release God's blessing into your life, even, as I say, to the point of healings and miracles. Don't be depending on the likes of me to be doing all the healings. Why don't you do a few yourself? Because if you trust in God, they will start happening. Trust in his promises. You will lay your hands on the sick and they will be healed. Now, my time is running out and I just want to end with um, a, a, a little novena prayer. Oh, well, it's not a novena prayer. It's a litany. And it's a litany of trust. So the response to this litany is, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. I believe that you are continually holding me, sustaining me, loving me. Jesus, I trust in you. That your love goes deeper than my sins and failings and transforms me. That not knowing what tomorrow brings is an invitation to lean on you that you are with me in my suffering. That my suffering united to your own will bear fruit in this life and the next. That you will not, not leave me orphaned, that you are present in your church. That your plan is better than anything else that you always hear me and in your goodness always respond to me. That you give me the grace to accept forgiveness and to forgive others. That you give me the strength I need for what is asked. That my life is a gift, Jesus. That you will teach me to trust in you that you are my Lord and my God, that I am your beloved one. And I'm going to add in an extra one. And for the future, uncertain though it be, Jesus, I trust in you. Isn't that wonderful? We trust in the Lord Jesus. So now we're going to bless the religious objects. And if you have a rosary or a picture or whatever it is, um, just hold it up and we will impart a blessing.
Now, all these religious objects are what we call sacramentals, not sacraments, but sacramentals. And the church gives them to us as signs and means of grace, but it's not magic. They are only effective to the extent to which you believe that God in the name of the church will bless you in and through them. Almighty God, we thank you for these religious objects, created things designed to raise our minds and heart to the realm of the uncreated, to your presence in heaven. We ask, Lord, that those who use these re religious objects would use them with devotion, with respect, and would have confidence that they can be the means of abundant graces. So Lord, as we use these religious objects, which we may be giving to other people, may blessing flow as a result of their trust in you in and through these religious objects. And we bless them now in your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Thanks very much. Thank you. So thanks very much to Father Pat. He's our most frequent speaker in our 33 years. He holds the record of the most frequent visits to the conference here to speak. So thanks very much, Father Pat.